All right, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So our, our speaker today is Dr. Vera Lute. Um, she's a professor emeritus um, from SLAC, the uh, uh, Stanford, well, it used to be the Stanford Linear, now it's uh, the just SLAC um, National Accelerator Laboratory, um, where she's worked in the field of experimental particle physics um, since 1974 at SLAC. Um, she uh, studied physics um, for her degree at Heidelberg University, um, doing a lot of her PhD research at CERN. Um, her career in physics has been described as spectacular. Um, and this was because there was a, a celebration of her work as she went into, um, uh, well, we, what level of retirement you've gone into, but She's gone into um, uh, emeritus uh, professorship at, at SLAC, and, and there was a retrospective, which we could all um, hope, and our uh, biggest hopes that there would be a large retrospective of one's career, but um, Dr. Lute has seen this happen for her. Um, she's made very important measurements, uh, including charge parity violation, important contributions to the discovery of the charm quark, uh, the pioneering use of silicon detectors in beam collision experiments, and the design and construction of the Babar experiment, and the study of the decay of B mesons. Uh, she's been a, a leader in the physics community, um, both in uh, service as uh, chair of several high-profile panels and associations, and uh, she is a fellow of the American Astronomical Society. It is my great pleasure to uh, introduce and let us all welcome Dr. Vera Lute. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome and the invitation to come here. It's clearly a beautiful area. Uh, so my focus today is the role of symmetries in particle physics. Uh, just give to you a brief outline. There's obviously been an introduction which is somewhat lengthy to give you a sort of the background of what the rest is all about. And I'll give, uh, discuss the two historical measurements and parity and CP violation and chaos. And then the, maybe the focus on more interesting things and the more recent measurements which largely were done with B factories of which there were, was one at Slack and the other one at KK. The one in KK is currently upgraded for future much higher intensities. <coughs> so what is symmetry? It's obviously a Greek word. It uh, is to be interpreted as an expression of equivalence between things or if you like in a more visual geometric form an agreement in dimension, proportion and arrangement. Now I think most of us know what symmetry is and uh, I certainly think it's an expression of harmony and perfection and design and many, many things. And you find those in ancient buildings like the tombs of important people, uh, places of worship, but you find them as well in dance and music. It's the, if you look at choreography, there's a lot of symmetry in that and that makes it so beautiful and likewise you listen to Bach or kind of composer, this structure is very symmetric and it's sort of very harmonious and easy to follow. And so symmetry is really ubiquitous and there's a lot of patterns we observe in nature, in plants and animals, in the arts, but as well in science. And here are some examples. You know, why are these things so beautiful? Because of the symmetry, be it a leaf, a flower, a shell, or one of the most beautiful animals, like a tiger. Uh, in, but they're man-made, symmetric objects of beauty. These are all from Paris, the beautiful Rosetta, uh, the entrance of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, there is the Eiffel Tower, and there's Miro with a beautiful design. All of those are beautiful because of this concept of symmetry that went into design. Now in science, it's somewhat different, and in science we link symmetry with invariance. Uh, if a system 
or process remains unchanged under a certain operation or transformation, we call it symmetric or we call it invariant. And here are some examples which are sort of a little simpler than the beautiful pictures. There is the Taj Mahal, beautiful building I had the pleasure of visiting. It has a left-right asymmetry, uh, symmetry, but as well, due to the reflecting pond, it has an up-down symmetry. There are simple things like a ball which is not marked like a soccer ball is symmetric in any kind of rotation. A bottle has an axis of rotation under which, unless you stick a, stick a label on the bottle, it looks the same from all directions. Any rotation will look the same. A snowflake, which is symbolized here, is a little different. It is uh, uh, certain angles when you come back to the initial state, not everyone. But there are a lot of... Uh, uh, mirror symmetries in that design. So, so that's sort of trying to give you a little bit of an idea. Now, symmetries and variants, as I said, are very closely linked. And I, in my mind, when I was a student reading a paper by C.S. View and T.D. Lee, really in annual reviews of nuclear particle science, of which I was an editor for 15 years later on, was really a beautiful paper. Any one of you want to learn about charge conjugation and parity, it's just one of the beautiful written papers. I don't think we write papers like that anymore. But anyway, I think they're, they're elegant, but are very important. And the most fundamental processes are, and that's at the level of particle physics, maybe nuclear and others, are simple transformations, for instance, translation in space. It doesn't matter where you do the experiment as long as the conditions are the same. You can move it 100 meters or you can do it on the other side of the globe. You should get the same answer, modulo systematic and statistical uncertainties. The same with time, rotations, reflections. A simple experiment or, uh, should not depend on those. There's charge conjugation. Some of you have been introduced to that recently. But the real link between symmetry and fundamental laws of physics was made by an outstanding mathematician by the name of Emmy Noether, who was, ended up finally getting a professorship at Göttingen, but then immigrated in the 30s to the States. Uh, and she basically stated that any differentiable symmetry, that's a continuous transformation, a symmetry of the action of a physical system has a concept, corresponding conservation law. This is a, was a fantastic piece of work. Uh, for some reason, she was never, I think she passed away too early to get the Nobel Prize. And this links the translation with momentum, translation in space with momentum conservation. It links time translation to energy conservation. And it links rotations to conservation of angular momentum as well, it's a little harder to explain to you, charge conjugation to gauge invariance. So this is a really beautiful fundamental work, and I must say I only found out about it about 15 years ago. I worked on CP and I never realized, or other invariance principles, never realized where the core was. It was at Göttingen, which was one of the best, probably the center of mathematics before the uh, beginning of World War II. So now let's come closer to particle physics. Most of you have probably heard of quarks. There's the fundamental fermions, that is, particles that have spin one half. And then there are bosons, which are on the right. Uh, they have integer spin. It's the top button here? This one, uh, the I, yeah. yeah. So there's a both, there's a, these are all bosons, and they're uh, responsible for interactions between these building blocks of nature. So there are three generations, it's always two quarks and two leptons. And they're distinguished uh, by the charge. For instance, the quarks have either, the upper ones have charged two-thirds, the lower ones minus one-third. But of course, the electron has, and its partners in the other generation, the muon and the tau, have spin minus one, and then they're associated with a neutrino, so that the so-called lepton number is conserved which all have zero mass, as best as we know today, or very small masses, and charge zero. So the first generation is really the ones the most of the matter is made of. 
is the proton, the neutrons, and then, of course, the electron and the neutrino. So if you want to make a proton, you take two u-quarks and a d, and you add up the charges, you indeed get charge one. If you do uh, one u and two d's, you get a neutral charge. Now, the mesons are this sort of, again, it's a lighter word, the hadrons as well, the lightest ones are the pions. And again, there you always take a quark and an antiquark. It could be the same quark, the same quark, just its antiparticle, or one of the others. So you combine. So this system was invented to basically explain the zoo of particles that were known, begin to be discovered in the late 50s and 60s. And it was Murray Gell-Mann who introduced those. And most people thought that it was just a, you know, a Lego set with which you can make up particles. Nowadays, I think we've seen a lot more phenomena which really point to constituents that have quark at, for instance, spin one, spin one half. They're not just funny objects. Uh, so the second and third generations existed all in the very beginning of the universe, at least we believe so, and they can be created and studied either in accelerator or nowadays in uh, cosmic ray studies. So that's, uh, that's all building blocks. Now a few words about the interactions. So those are the, uh, that was the last column we had, the bosons. Everybody knows. Where's the top? Oh, the top. Everybody knows gravitation, but people, most people, don't realize it's the weakest of all forces. It depends on the mass. All particles that have mass will be sensitive to gra gravitational forces. So the weak interactions, which here are sort of normalized to, to be of order one, and they are mitigated by either by bosons, which one of them is neutral. And then there's a pair of charged ones. We will talk today mostly about the charged one, which will be, but they act on quarks and leptons. And then there's electromagnetic, which is the agent is the photon, and anything electrical cho electrically charged will be affected by those. And then there's a strong interaction, which is transmitted by gluons, and they react, they influence quarks and gluons, and there is something called color, which I don't mention on this. So let's go back to this uh, picture we just saw before. Here I indicated what actually happens. So say there are these three generations, and actually each lepton, uh, in each lepton generation, we have a conservation of lepton number, which was invented because whenever we create an electron, we have to either collect a positron or an associated antineutrino. So, for instance, if you have beta decay of the neutron, we first only observe the proton and the electron until people said there's something wrong, this is not a two beta decay. Now, Pauli was smart enough to just say, well, maybe there is a little neutral particle uh, that we just missed and there should be missing energy. And when people look, they realize this was a three body decay and not a two body decay. But that's absolutely one way where people thought about introducing a conservation which is lepton number conservation. And these are other examples. For instance, if a tau decays, there's always a tau neutrino, uh, and then either a pion or another pair of leptons. And, uh, and then the other one is important in the scheme. There are no interactions in the horizontal. There are no flavor changing neutral currents. Each family has flavors, and so you can't go from a T to a a C because they have the same charge. It always goes either diagonally or vertical. That's properties of these interactions. The same is true for leptons. You can't uh, go from a tau directly to a mu. You go to a tau neutrino and then you can make a muon and a muon neutrino. So those are some of the fundamentals. Now let's come back to the symmetries, which will be the main topic of this talk. Uh, we talked about parity. Basically that's normal language we call left-right asymmetry. So what happens is if you apply an operator parity, then all space coordinates will change sign. However, an angular momentum will not. So that's a very important thing to remember. So these are here's sort of my game to show it in terms of hands. Okay. The, uh, these are the antis and that's, those the re that's the anti world and that's the real world. Uh, so then there's charge conjugation, and that's that all quantum, all charge-like quantum number 
numbers will change sign. And that's once a lepton number will become positive or neg negative when you apply this operator. And then people, as we'll see, discovered, well, there's certain interaction that violated violates C and P, and so we can make a new operation, which is a combination which actually translate meta into antimatter, uh, like a K0, which is uh, uh, one of the so-called strange particles. It is not an eigenstate of, of CP, but if you generate the antiparticle, but uh, there are others which are eigenstate. For the neutrino, this is probably the most interesting one. If you apply it, the P to the left-handed neutrino, we know you get a right-handed one, and that doesn't exist in the world. But if you then apply the C, then you end up with a right-handed anti-neutrino. So this is one of the fundamentals in the neutrino world which has an impact very clearly on parity. So strong and electromagnetic interactions are invariant under both C alone and P alone. We have no evidence that there is a violation. Weak interactions, Many of them conserve parity, but there is parity violation, and it's usually accompanied by charge conjugation, so almost all processes conserve CP, but as we'll see, some do not. The one uh, discrete symmetry is the product of all these three. The third factor is the reversal of time. CPT is a very fundamental uh, asymmetry, which today we haven't seen any violation of. So if you see CP violation, you need to find T and we'll find that T is violated too. So that the sort of summary of all this, you could say, well, symmetries are very beautiful, but uh, as physicists spend a lot of time to look for violations of symmetry. Because after all, the symmetries are just some kind of our picture of what the world is like. And it may not always be right. Here's just a picture about what the neutrino does. A normal neutrino is a massless particle, and so the spin has to be aligned with the, green, the yellow here is its momentum, has to be aligned with the momentum but of opposite sign. There is no, if you now did parity, you get this picture. The momentum vector would look like this, but then the, uh, the spin would go in the same direction particle like that does not exist. So that's one of the fundamentals that was the basis of uh, suggesting experiments that look for parity violation. So now let's look a little bit at the experiments. Yeah, Dr. Lu, uh, you had the Emmy Noter mm -hmm. quote, which was uh, about every time there is a symmetry, there is a, there is there is a, basically, there's a conservation. Well, there's a translation which is continuous. Uh, I see. That's concerned. So okay. the, the C uh, is not part of that. I it see. Translate. Okay. Because I was, I was... conservational in that way. I mean, you can make some arguments and put, but the fundamental proof she really had was a differential process, which is something that's continuous. I see. So and it's like translation in space or time. So those translations, then they have those, they those have continuous this. translations, they have, there's a conservation law, and our yeah. students are familiar with there's yeah. conservation laws in that. Absolutely. And then this most recent slide, is, these, these set of slides mm -hmm. are, there are, are um, discrete, sim discrete, discrete symmetries, and we're very interested once they, they don't behave, you can't, Flip a thing in, in a in a particular way and get this other particle. That that particle doesn't exist. It's usually the other way around. You, you look at something and then you ask, why doesn't this happen? Right. And that happened with strangeness. You know, that's why the kaons are people had pions and they did all sorts of measurements in cosmic ray. The world was easy, and then they saw these strange things happen with kaons. They called it strange. At that time, they didn't have a name. They called it a strange, and that was retained as a name of the flavor for the s -core. And that's an example of, of this, vi this violation saying there's some other interesting physics and yeah. we have to give it a name yeah, that... name and um, strangeness conserved in strong interaction. So if you have a kaon scattering on a proton, you can make a baryon which has strangeness. But it's always the same strangeness as the kaon has. So if you get a k-minus, you get a baryon if you start with a K plus, it 
it's harder to do because you have to make an anti-barium. To make an anti-barium, you have to make another barium too, otherwise you violate barium. So that's this kind of thing. These, these things have just been developing. I say not finding finding the neutrino always go with the electron and say, hey, there must be some rule why they're always paired. So they called it lepton number. It's just a fictitious thing, but it's, it's a concept that works, and that's what physics does. You have a concept, as long as somebody uh, there's no proof that it's not valid. It's a good tool. That's a very common, that's how we all work. You know, we're trying to find out is there something we've overlooked which is not in fish. So now we come to uh, to the 50s, and at that time, the strange particles were known, mostly from cosmic rays. But there was a puzzle, and this was then as well done in bubble chambers. There were one particle they called the theta which was charged, and another one they called the tau. This is not the tau lepton, it's just the historical name. We just pulled up two names. And one decayed into two pions, and the other one in three pions. And if you look at parity, that means the tau, if parity was conserved, had plus parity, and the, 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 the theta and the tau had minus parity. So it was the same particle, it would be violating parity, and that people thought would never happen. If it did happen, it was the same particle, it meant parity was not conserved in, in weak interaction. So there were two very smart young Chinese uh, faculty members at Columbia, <coughs> T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang, and they just said, well, we actually don't really have evidence that parity is conserved in weak interaction. So let's think of something we can do. So they made actually explicit proposals to their faculty members at Columbia one was look at beta decay, and uh, the practical thing to do is cobalt 60 going into nickel 60 and having a beta, undergoing a beta decay, and then polarize the, in a magnetic field the cobalt, and then see what happens. Well, actually, there was an expert on polarizing uh, nuclei, Ernest Ambler, at the Bureau of Standards in Washington, and he teamed up with CSV an experimenter at Columbia, a woman, uh, uh, next picture, and uh, let's see what happens. There was another thing, there was a pions which were produced uh, at the Nevis accelerator and was known to decay into a muon and a neutrino or some other neutral particle. And uh, this was actually after Wu and Engler had succeeded seeing the first preliminary result at the famous Chinese lunch in Colombia on Friday at noontime, uh, the T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang encouraged the young experimentalist or challenged them, uh, Richard Garvin and Leon Lederman, to do a muon experiment. Garvin ended up as head of IBM, and as you know, Leon Lederman got, shared the Nobel Prize on the neutrinos years later. So this is a picture, again, I'll try to give you some pictures to say what physicists do. It's Madame Vu, as everybody calls her, I don't even know what CS stands for, and Ernest Ambler. And they did this experiment, and if uh, there was a, uh, a change in the rate of the emission of the electron from this beta decay of the cobalt, uh, then uh, that would be parity violation. If the rate was independent of the polarization, then uh, there was no parity violation. And what they did is they had a had a magnet which uh, had a cryogenic system and a magnet uh, down to few, uh, fractions of a kelvin, and they realized depending on the direction of the magnet, apparently the thing they had to dismantle part of the cryogenic systems to do the measurements, so they only had the system cold for a few minutes. But they started out at a certain rate, which then would go down in one polarization, they started out another, which would increase, and once the magnet would warm, they were the same. So then there was no spin dependence, so they proved that there was a spin dependence, which was a proof of parity violation. Then there was the muon experiment, which I think started on Friday afternoon, an experiment put it together in Nevis. I think Leon Letterman went to sleep on Sunday night and, uh, and uh, Richard Garvin finished the experiment by Monday morning. And uh, this is what they did. They had a beam of pions which uh, were stopped in a, um, 
in an absorber, and then after time the pion decays and you make a muon, and then the muon decays, and then you have a magnet system here, and you change the magnetic field and look at the look at the muon coming out, and uh, at a fixed direction. So as they were change, varying the field, the rate changed just in the way they expected it. And so this is, I think, one of the most beautiful, most elegant experiments I can think of. All you all you change is the setting of the magnet. You see this beautiful variation. As I say, it took about six, seven hours to take that measurement, and that was then the confirmation of the uh, of the measurement by Wu and uh, et al. And uh, they published in the same issue. And they actually waited. Let among Garvin waited to the experiment for C.S. Wu was finished because a very difficult experiment to do, and uh, they published in the same issue. So this is just now a little visually to try to explain maybe a little cl more clearly what happens. There's a pion which is at rest. So at rest, the two momenta which have to be equal, the pion has no spin and the neutrino has a well-defined spin. That means the spin of the muon has to be this way. Now you uh, go and uh, look what happens if you apply mirror symmetry, you get this picture and you end up with a neutrino which is right-handed and that just doesn't exist so there's no weight. Now you look what it would look like if I do charge conjugation instead of a positive pion I have a negative one you get a negative muon and you get an anti-neutrino and again this anti-neutrino now is its spin opposite to the direction whereas an anti-neutrino is right-handed so that doesn't exist but if you do both then you get, again, a process that can proceed, keeping the neutrino uh, spin convention intact, and uh, that is then the combined operation of CMP. And it's a proof as well, and it's thought through, that not only parity was violated, but at the same time, as you saw, uh, charge conjugation was violated. So that, out of this came the idea the product is concerned. Now we go on and go to K neutral chaos. There are all sorts of particles I don't do here. That's the time. Um, and it was slightly before these experiments were finished at Columbia. There were again two very smart theorists, Murray Gellman, who got the prize for the quark model and other things, and Abram Pies, who wrote wonderful books about uh, science. I think uh, one of my favorite writers big books like this. One about Einstein called Supple is the Law. Um, and uh, they postulated that there would be two strange neutral mesons, the K0 and the K0 bar, its antiparticle, who are produced in strong interactions. That had how they how they make them. But uh, and they would have definite strangeness, but no definite lifetime. This has never existed, a particle not having a definite lifetime. So what was going on? Well, they postulated, well, there may be two states, which are called K1 and K2, which have this definite lifetime, but which are a mixture of the two. And it's written down here in a quantum mechanical schematic way. So there's a K minus, which is the sum of a K0 and a K plus. And thereby, if you try to apply CP by changing every particle and the antiparticle, you see it's a CP eigenstate. You do the, and then the second one is a K2, which just has a negative sign, but is still a CP eigenstate, whereas the kaons are not uh, the K0 and K0 bar, because the K0 CP changes the K0 and K0 bar, so it's a different state. So that was their postulate. However, what you could think, well, maybe the K1 and K2, are they really identical with these two states for the different lifetimes? Maybe CP is not conserved. If that was the case, maybe there's a small admixture which mathematically you put in as a small contribution epsilon. It's actually 3 times 10 to minus 3, as it proven later by experiment. So if there is CP violation, then maybe these two, two different states with definite lifetimes have a small admixture of, of the other. If epsilon is zero, then of course the KS and KL are identical to these hypothesize K1 and K2. So, as we said, there was 
people knew about neutral counts, they had two Katik Hamels. One was 2 pi, and the other one was 3 pi. Look at the CP properties, one then has CP plus and the other one CP minus, but the lifetimes are totally different. Hundreds, in fact, a hundred or more different. So that was exactly what uh, Pice and Gellman sort of postulated that was known. So in the early 1960s, a young assistant professor, Jim Cronin at, uh, at Princeton, had actually built this nice, very nice spectrometer, which is shown here. But then his senior colleague, Val Fitch, suggested, well, we should really, really uh, study these long-lived chaos and see whether this long-lived one actually has a decay as well in two parts. That was never seen up to that. So they built this spectrometer, and it's, uh, uh, so there was a long beam, and uh, so all the K-shorts, the long-lived neutral counts has died away, so there was a K-long coming in. If it was a three-body decay, then the momenta of the secondary particles which were measured the, K on the neutral beam was never seen, you know, you just see the decay particles, then the two momenta should not add up because there was a missing pi zero. But if it was a two-body decay, then the momenta of these two should be, uh, should be balanced uh, with a at least in direction with the direction of the incoming beam. So they measured the angle between the incoming beam and the vector sum of the two particles they observed. They never tried to observe the pi zero. And so when you look then at masses of these two particles close to the mass of the known uh, K0, they saw a big peak. And that was the proof of CP violation and of the, the Nobel Prize. The other K modes, which you can as well, K on the neutral K on the K modes where you can test CP violation. And one is the charge asymmetry, the like long lived K on decays into pion as basically make a, has a beta decay. And it could either produce a, a charged uh, positive pion or a negative pion. And uh, so if you look at this long-lived beam, you expect, well, there's a decay. Uh, at short lifetimes, you see a decay, and you see evidence for this mixing, which goes like a sino sinusoidal curve, which is, has a cosine term, which is equal to the mass difference between the k-long and k-short. But if you go out at long lifetimes, all you should see is a constant. And this is exactly this constant. This is the decay time. This was an experiment designed by Jack Steinberger, who shared the price with Leon Lederman and Mel Schwartz for the neutrino. He was my advisor, and so this is a result of my PhD thesis. And uh, so the, the number we got was this one. It's fully consistent with the current world average. So. And this, this experiment has never been repeated since, but it's, uh, it's well known. Different methods have been used, but not this one. Uh, so, so that's the Kaon story. But the, for many years, the neutral chaos was the only system in which people observed CP violation. So the theories, something like the superweak model, is a, trans, a new interaction which has uh, strangeness changing by two units from going from K0, K0 bar, and those things. They were there for a long time. Took almost two decades to prove that that idea was wrong. Uh, so here I just uh, noted down the comparison because in the meantime we found another neutral meson. This one, instead of strangeness, has a beauty quantum number. Its mass is a factor 10 higher, so it's five proton masses rather than half a proton mass. The lifetimes are two orders, almost two orders of magnitude different, but this mass difference is different by about the same amount. So the product, delta mt, is about tau, is about the same. And that really made experimentations with B mesons possible. If that was not the case, we would have been dead. Now, for a long time, people described the mixing of K0, K0 bar, or now B0, B0 bar, through these kind of interactions called second order weak interaction because the multiple bit vertices. So by this process, with this loop here, a B bar quark can actually go to a B. And there's a similar process, slightly rotated, there's a top quark involved and so on, uh, where B bar can go. So there are two diagrams, but they're basically very similar. And so you can actually have transitions by weak interaction only, not by strength, by strong, 
where a B0, as here pictured, can convert into B0 bar. Exactly what people have had observed for decades in the, in the chaos system. So the high mass B have very large variety of decay modes, which means each decay mode is each branching fraction is very small, uh, but they're very large asymmetries. In chaos, we only have two or three decay modes, so the decay, the branching fractions are large, but the CP is small. So that's the sort of difference, and that's the new world of the last two decades is really studying the So let me quickly give you a, a rundown of the experiments I've worked on, helped to design and build and analyze data from, which was we named BB Bar or Baba. We actually got a license from, uh, from the authors of that famous elephant in the kids' stories, very popular among our French collaborators. So this is a detector. It's a typical particle colliding beam detector, but this whole thing would easily fit into the in core of the Atlas detector, inside, uh, you know, inside the magnet. This is six by six by six meters. The beams were chosen to be of different energy because if the beams collided and produced beam mesons, the beam mesons would be almost at rest, and that means we couldn't measure their decay time. So we made one, which was a novel idea, to get a 9 GV beam coll collide with a uh, 3 GV beam. And then you have around the beam pipe, which of course holds the vacuum, you have layers just like onion layers. You have a precision silicon detector uh, to get down to a few micron resolution, 20 micron or so in this case, wasn't so important. Then you have a drift chamber, a wire chamber to measure momentum and angles of the particles coming out. Uh, then there's a usually yeah, we have a calorimeter where it is here, about six, seven thousand uh, cesium crisp, cesium iodide crystals, which measure photon energies and identify electrons through electromagnetic interaction in the device. And then outside the magnet, there is uh, basically steel and detectors uh, to find muons, which will penetrate and we can see. So this is a real life picture, one of my colleagues who is about my size, so he could climb inside and do some rail repair work at some point. But the drift chamber is here, you can, the beam pipe is taken out. This is actually the end of a very novel uh, Cherenkov counter, which allows us to tell, which is very important to tell chaos from pions. Um, this thing was operated at Slack, so there was a similar machine in Japan, and we competed well. Uh, we produced about 500 million pairs of BB bar because the machine is operated at a resonance which you can hardly see. The big resonances are here, but this is above the threshold of making a BB bar pair. Remember, this is over 5 GV, so you need a little more than 10 GV center of mass energy to make the BB bar pairs. So we're measuring here, so there is a background ratio of about 1 to 4, uh, but that's very good compared to uh, any other machine. 24% signal. And to say the amazing interaction is annihilation, annihilation into this resonance and making a BB bar and nothing else. There's no extra pion or anything else. And that's the beauty of it. And so you can use kinematic reconstruction. You reconstruct all the secondary particles, you can get the momenta, you can figure out which particles belong to one B, which to the other. So that was uh, perfected. And we'll come back to that. Further. So this is sort of a picture if you look at a reconstructed event from the end. So the colored tracks are the tracks in the drift chamber and then the, the green histograms are as the energy in the colorimeter all projected now into the middle plane or the end plane. So these things are just in two dimensions to make it, make it easier to see. So this is a Ypsilon 4S going into B plus and B minus, the question which track belongs to the B plus, which B minus, the thing is almost at rest. So it's, it's not like two jets coming out and you know exactly one quark went there and the one pump there. So that's the challenge and that's what we do. We look around and see whether we can re reconstruct a, uh, a B and then once we have that we can take the tracks out and we know the rest is now from the other B. This happens to be a decay, if you like a semi-leptonic decay. So there's a neutrino which we can reconstruct from the missing momentum and energy in the event. 
So we know there was a neutrino if we did everything else right. So that's the beauty of, of this kind of experiment. Let me just show you a couple of variables. Um, the, this is how we actually find the, the B decays. There's two things we can do. We can reconstruct the momentum of the particles which we think belong to one of the Bs and basically calculate the mass because we knew the energy. The two Bs have the same mass, which means they have to have the same energy. And so that's an easy thing to do. And the other one is the, the energy of the reconstructed B should be equal in the center of mass to one of the beams. So that's a number we know very well. So those are two variables which we use to basically find the Bs out of the 11 tracks, which of the five tracks belong to one B and which to the other. So that's, uh, that's the main thing. And then we reconstruct leptons and we identify cairns, which are very important for this. So, as I say, this is the real design here that we have production of a pair of Bs from a resonance which has well-defined quantum numbers. We never get that in a proton machine and even in your plus and minus at another machine like lab. You don't know what the quantum numbers a priori are or what you reconstruct. Here this is well defined. And, uh, but the specialty because of these neutral bees, they can mix. And they will mix till one of the bees decays. At that time you know exactly, to reconstruct that first decaying bee, you know exactly not only what the other particles are, you know exactly that the other one was a B or B bar, because up to that point, it's always a B or a B bar. And that's a unique thing, and this is a sort of similar to what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen postulated a long time ago in quantum mechanics. They call it the Spukhafte Fernwirkung. You know, why does one B know about the other? And you can, it's expressed here in that the final state is described by an asymmetric wave function of two orthogonal states and you can just choose any kind of orthogonal states and we do that in the experiment we either use uh, uh, a CP eigenstate or flavor eigenstates which are orthogonal and then develop the mathematics. So how do we do the experiment? I said that this oscillation is really the, the key thing and the very important thing is that the product of the mass and the lifetime is, uh, is large enough to actually do a measurement. So if you just look at the detect B or B bars, you have an exponential decay, which is then modulated by this mixing parameters. So if there was no mixing, you just have a normal exponential decay. But you see, just like you saw in my thesis, you saw this big thing going up and down. That was the oscillation which comes from these terms. And uh, so what we do is we do this tagging uh, because at the time of the decay we know what the other B is. So how do we tag? Well the B, the B quark goes to a C quark and can pro then produces a lepton of definite charge. The charge of the lepton tells you whether this was a B or B bar. Or the C quark, which then is produced, could decay and C goes provincially into strain. So if you find a negative k on, then you can tell it one. That was a B bar. The positive k on will tell you B. So this is a technique that's used very, very frequently in these experiments. So we start out here. The Bs move a little bit. That's the, for, the 4S resonance making a B and a B bar. One of them decays, and you find the k on or the lepton to know what the tag was. And then you wait for the other one to decay, and this is a reconstruction of a CP eigenstate. So we look at tag decays and CP. And that's where this, uh, this mixing is really what makes this system so sensitive and allows you to do these experiments. And I uh, say, so what we do, a B will decay with no oscillation, that's the exponential term, or it will do an oscillation into B bar, and if they have a common decay, which is then the two of them will interfere. And uh, so, uh, so that's, the, again, the basis of this, the high sensitivity in decay and mixing to then a decay to a common eigenstate gives you this kind of thing. And then there's a convention of how we plot this thing, and you basically get, for this one here, you get two 
decay distributions, and this is at decay time equals zero. Of course, the resolution of the experiment will not give you a curve like that. It will be rounded off because of resolution and time and so on and background. And then we compare these two decays, the tag which gave you a B and the one with B bar, and formulate an asymmetry, which is a, a usually a very nice thing to have, a difference over the sum. So many of the normalization factors all drop out and the efficiencies drop out, and you measure this time-dependent, decay time-dependent asymmetry. And that's now from the bar, the result, the final result, which I think uh, we uh, it's a relatively recent update, but probably 2010, but nothing changed since. So just like in the chaos, you have these two decays, but if you, that's the individual decay distributions, and depending on which were the tag decays before the CP state or after, you get a, you call the decay time positive or negative, so that's why you get negative decay times. It's the, the, it's the tag decay after. State. I mean, that just happens, and you don't want to throw half the data away. You, know, you could do that and only measure this part, but you, of course, it's much better to do it all. And then if you do the asymmetry, the difference between the two, you project out, again, the sine or cosine term. It turns out that the, uh, this term here, this coefficient here, is basically zero, whereas this is the one we pay attention to, and that's now known very precisely from the bar and down. So that was the first thing these B factory did. So uh, one more little excursion into theory to Japanese theorists at that time, pretty young as well. And already in '74, when we only knew about three quarks, made the postulation that if we had six quarks, that is three generation, like I showed you, we could actually find a way to integrate CP violation in our model. This is, I mean, I remember asking Mascava, how did you dare to postulate the six quarks when you only know about three? You basically didn't have the generation picture. You know, it was easy to add the six quark when you have five, but postulate this. So anyway, they did it. And uh, so they, I don't go into the detail, but they've derived relations uh, which uh, uh, are basically equations, there's unitarity conditions, it's an equation in complex plane which we can always illustrate by a triangle. That's a general feature. I mean, other people have done that too. So there are many of these triangles by relations and this one deals with a BD case in the sense that the angles are derived from symmetries and the sides are derived from decay rows decades of the beat. So this is a famous triangle people have shown all together. That's the scheme and this is where we are today. These are all the measurements of the sides and the three angles. If you take the angles, i just give you an example here, that's the best measurement of individual angles. You add them up and I was surprised to get 100 maybe. <laughs> but it's of course five. But that was the main program of the B factories, the angles. We're still quibbling a little bit about this side. I actually have worked mostly on this and this side. And uh, the answers are still a little controversial. But that was the, the success of the CP program in, in BDKs to sort this out. And it's pretty solid. It doesn't give you a real explanation what's behind that. But it's a scheme in which you can integrate the CP violation. And you need six quarks to do it. The final topic. I want to touch is something relatively new. It's the violation of t the uh, symmetry of time reversal. That is testing, is the rate of a process A to B equal to B to A? Experimentally, that's very hard to prove. There have been experiments of certain other variables which should be sensitive to that for the last, as long as I can remember. When I was a student, people already measured uh, what's called the electric dipole moment of the neutron. It's still going on. The measurements are better and are getting better and the theory estimates get down all the time. So there is basically, um, one needs certain variables which we call odd in T, which means the time change. And one example is the electric dipole moment. 
and of particles with spin, and this wife violates T and also P, and this, for instance, is the current measurement of this. Look at the experiment. 10 to the minus 26 uh, uh, E charge E centimeters. And it's still going on. You need very intense at neutrons at rest to do that. It's a, it's a tour de force, but people are still working on it. To look at, so this is basically a, a, st a steady system which where you measure the dependence on, again, magnetic fields and polarization. The other one is, of course, really look, is A times A to B the same as B to A? That's very hard to do experimentally. For stable particles, one could think of doing it with neutrinos. But then think about how to do this. <laughs> you know, how to get a beam of, neon, of electron neutrinos and look for neurons coming out and vice versa. And for unstable particles, it's difficult. You have a pion to go into two particles. How can we get the two particles by weak interaction to interact and make a pion again? It's basically not possible. So this is still uh, very much in the works. Uh, so there come the B factory, where we measured CP. Well, if CPT is conserved, we should have time rivers. Actually, in chaos, this was done when I was a student, and some people claimed they already nailed it down. I never, never believed that, because if they were right, I would have not measured CP, but T, well, T violation. And it's very hard in count because there's so few tools. The B have this enormous number of decay modes, the small branching fraction, but you can really do exactly what you want to do, test an asymmetry. And that's related to this entanglement with the tagging of and here is a schematic, and I'll have to go through that. It's a little complicated. So there's our epsilon 4 s It's made by this annihilation of the beams. And we make, uh, we make two Bs, B0 in this case, and B0 bar. We look for the B0 and say, is there a positive? If there is a positive lepton, then we know this is a B0. That means the particle that hasn't decayed yet is a B0 bar, and we look for its eigen CP eigenstate. Now, if you mirror this, you just say, OK, I produce a, um, uh, and that's done with a flavor eigenstate, which give you either a positive or negative lepton. The second case is you could use CP eigenstates, and that's down here. You just say, well, uh, the first decay is a CP minus state, which I detect here. And then I look for, uh, I know that the second particle was a B bar, B zero bar, and look for the electron. So this is a big sorting experiment. You look at all those things, and it's quite an effort to do with, you know, you start out with 500 million events, and you have to, have to sort all this out. And so you basically measure the sequential decays of both Bs, and define the time difference again with a sign. If the flavor state is the first, if this is positive, that means the flavor state decayed first, has a smaller decay time than the CP state. It's this process that is uh, what we did here. And if it's negative, it's the other way around. So these are really two processes, and we call one of them the, uh, the CP eigenstate, and the other one that. So these are two, uh, two processes. Uh, where we can uh, do this observation. So there are four pairs of those transitions which we can identify. And for each, and then you can do a very similar thing with a CP transformation or CPT. We did all of those. And it was done actually by a group in Spain. It was uh, initiated by some theorists and then a graduate student and his advisor did all the work. Beautiful task. So this is a little complicated, and it took me as well to, it's hard to really go through this very quickly. But there are these transitions, B0 to B plus, and uh, B0, B minus, and these, all those things, and they're related, and this is the transformation. This is the one state, and that's the T transformed state. You just invert the two. And so you do this pairing, and then you have very similar decay distributions, just like we had in the CP case. You know, depending on which is first, you get these slightly different because you get a sign difference in the, uh, uh, 
in the cosine in the sine term of the asymmetry. So you do that. Uh, then we do the same thing as we did before. We have an exponential, and then we have the modulation with these terms with the sine and the cosine. We already know that this is small, so we really have to only focus on that. But people did both. And so we, we do these uh, in total eight different decays, and we pair them, and then uh, differentiate how the times go, what is the tag, and what is the what is the CP tag, and, uh, and then we do a fit to the asymmetry. We take this and form an asymmetry, just like we did in the kaon, and we are left with this cosine term and the sine term. And uh, so then, depending on for time reversal, uh, we expect, uh, have certain expectation if it's violated, for instance, if the S is different from zero, and so on. So there are all these conditions, you work them out. It's a little complicated, but if you make plot the symmetries, then it looks a little uh, similar as we had before. And this time, we, f we actually flip the positive and ne negative times to just uh, get more statistics and, and show this. But this is exactly what, uh, uh, what we expected and the effect is, is, is pretty big. It's 14 sigma different from zero. So that was a very pleasant surprise. And so if you, these are, these are now the numerical numbers, and we expect here uh, basically 1.4 and we get 1.37. The 1.4 is what we expect for CP. If CP is equal to T. And then again, we, you can do this uh, plot the data in two different ways with positive and negative signs depending on the, on the decay you look at. And so this whole thing, if there was no CP violation, the data would accumulate here. And that's the 14 sigma difference we get. So I say we did the same with CPT, again pairing four different, uh, a total of eight, but make four different pairs and we get zero with a significance of 0.3, so very consistent with zero, whereas if we do the CP game, we get 1.3 in this analysis, and again, we get a very clear signal. So we've really shown in this beautiful example that uh, CP and T really, and as well independent CPT, these are different, these are independent decay modes, they're not, they're separate. We measure CP in this mode, we measure T, CPT, that all this works beautifully. So, still, we still have a problem with CP. So, CPT looks fine, and this algorithm which uh, people have given us seems to work. However, we still don't understand with these measurements how the present world is made of matter or antimatter, but only one of the two. Okay, so that's a puzzle. And most of you have heard of Andrei Sakharov so in his later years, but much earlier, in 67, he laid down three conditions that have to be met. If after the Big Bang there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter to arrive at the current state. So where did one matter or antimatter go? You have to have violation of baryon number, because if you don't, if the baryons stay the same, you know, you never change the matter antimatter. And uh, so you need something like a proton decay. And usually theorists talk about uh, baryon number violation in connection with lepton number violation. They basically <coughs> want the, uh, the proton decay into a lepton and some other particle, the pion or kaon. Uh, we need both CP and C violation, and we need what they call it. Uh, thermodynamical equilibrium, uh, non-equilibrium, because otherwise, again, if one reaction went this way, you would have another one in just opposite way and still conserve the baryon number. So all these conditions have to be met, and this is clearly not understood. Our current, the strength of CP that we have today is much too weak to explain this process, and something is just not understood. Most people think there must be other sources of CP violation we don't know about. It could be in strong interactions, somewhere hidden. And so people keep looking. 
So as I say, if you go back to the beginning, there was P and C in nuclear beta decay, and CP was considered perfect. Then we observed in B and K and uh, in K and B decay, uh, this mixing and the CP violation consistent with a new picture of the origin from the standard model. But as I say we failed to predict the baryon photon ratio. Uh, and we're, as you see, 10 orders of magnitude off of what we have. So there's a huge problem. And so there must be other sources. Some theories predict uh, uh, the, uh, the adequate amount, but none of these are proven. There's, uh, you know, Higgs duplets and leptogenesis and many, many different things. So let me conclude just with a few summaries. Uh, I think still, uh, symmetries are very important, elegant, and has given us uh, conservation laws uh, we all respect. Uh, in the discrete symmetries, there were surprises in the 50s, which led to a lot of explorations and new understanding and insight. And at current energies, um, the CP violation we observed, or the time reversal, is fully consistent uh, with, uh, with our understanding, but we know there's a big hole we need to fill. There must be something else. And uh, the focus at the moment at the energy frontier is really uh, of what they call dynamic symmetry breaking. And uh, clearly, hopefully in the next decade or two, we'll get some insight either from accelerator or from uh, cosmology and uh, research. So I still think symmetries are beautiful, but uh, the search for broken symmetries will continue.